see fight your battles. Jehovah needs he fight your battles. Jehovah needs he fight your battles. Sing with me, sing with me. Jehovah needs he fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha in your body. Shalom in your feet, Jehovah needs he fights. Jehovah needs he fights your battle. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Shalom be your peace.
trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Cause I will remain. I will remain. Comforted in this. I will see. another two hours y'all keep singing that right there because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me my soul cries out Woo, thank you Lord thank you Lord good morning walk church who's excited to be in the house of the Lord today come on hallelujah thank you so much for being with us today to all of our guests that are online with us today we want to say thank you for joining us you could have worshiped anywhere today it's our first time guest you could have worshiped anywhere in the country today but you chose to worship with us today and we want to say thank you for that and in that, if this is your very first time worshiping with us, this is your very first time coming in these walls here, there's a connection card that we have. And we would love for you to be able to fill this card out. And filling this card out, it just allows us the opportunity to connect with you. We're not going to bombard you. We're not going to overflood your email with a whole bunch of junk mail and all that kind of stuff. But what we will do, one of our leaders will contact you so that we can do life with you. 
because we understand in life you need people to do life with amen so if this is your very first time with us we would love for you to fill this card out uh, here at Walk, we know that there are steps that we're all taking. That's why we're called Walk Church. And so for your next step, your next step, say, hey, you know what? I've come today. What's my next step? Your next step would be our three-week challenge. Everybody say three-week challenge. In our three-week challenge, we would ask that you would hang out with us for about three weeks. Now, in that three weeks, you'll decide whether you like us or we like you. Now, I know that we're going to like you. I just don't know if you're going to like us. So in that process, we ask that you would just hang out with us for the next three weeks. And if you decide that, hey, maybe this is not the church for you, we still want to do life with you. We still want to help you find a church that's good for you. But there's some incredible churches in, this, in, the, in the valley of Las Vegas that we want to connect you with. So let us do life with you. Next step for somebody else, say, you know what? I've been coming and I've taken a three-week challenge, but you know what? I realize that as I've been coming, I really don't know the Lord. And your next step is salvation. If that's you today, we would love for you to fill this card out. Someone wants to talk to you. We want to tell you what that looks like. We want to share with you the joy that we have on the inside of us. We want to be able to share that with you. We say, you know what, Pastor? Hey, man, I've been coming and I know the Lord. What's my next step? Your next step could be baptism. Somebody say baptism. We had some, a couple getting baptized just before this service started. We, we on a six-week streak. Everybody say six weeks. God has blessed us that six weeks someone decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to live out Matthew 28. I want to be baptized. I want to let the whole world know what has happened on the inside of my life. I want to declare it to the world. And so baptism could be the next step for you. Or you say, hey, you know what? I've been through baptism. I I've given my life to the Lord and I've been hanging out with y'all, but I want to be family. And so that next step for you could be join the family. We have a, what we call join the family. And the first three weeks of the month, the first week we get to know you. Second week you get to know us. And the third week we put all that together. And then the fourth week there's a graduation ceremony and a good time to eat. You know I love to eat. Yes. You know I love to eat. And so we would love to you not just to be family. We, lo we love friends, but we really enjoy family. Because that means we get to really do life together. And so if that's you today, we would love the opportunity to uh, walk with you in that next step. And so for some of you, that next step for you could just be, hey, you know what? I need prayer today. I have a praise report. There's a small card. It just says prayer. And every Tuesday, our staff get together and we pray over these cards. Every Wednesday, we have a night of prayer and God has just been doing some incredible, incredible things. And so we're just so blessed that God would. So if you wouldn't mind, say, you know what? I got a prayer request. Would you put that in so that we would be able to pray over those cards? And as we talk about prayer, I realize that our God is holy and he is righteous. And sometimes for us, because we see God over here, we turn this way and we really don't give him everything. And so I would that we would pray through this prayer prompter today. Because our God is a holy God, forgive us for not trusting you with. What are we not trusting God with today? Come on, open your eyes. Our finances. Come on, somebody else. Family. Our future. Come on. We entrust it to our own wherewithal. God, we, we're not trusting you with our, our, our spouses, our children, our job, our minds, our sanity. God, would you forgive us? We desire to give you all of us and not just some of us. And so, Father, we pray that today that we, your sons and your daughters, we would honor you with our whole life because you are a holy God. And you're not just holy today, or you were holy just yesterday. You're holy forever and ever and ever. And so we can trust you with our lives. So today, would you meet us at our need? In Jesus' name we pray. Would you mind standing all over the building as we continue in our time of worship today? God, we thank you because you are holy.
thank you for that today that we can trust you that we can give you all that we are so would you speak to our hearts now God we know that we can trust you with everything because your track record precedes you you have always been good you have 
always been great. You have always been merciful. And so God, we thank you that you forgive us and that you want to be in right relationship with us. Your arms are open wide. And so we say today, Abba Father, take us, feed us, speak to us. A lot of the words that fall from the lips of Pastor Hyde be the words that fall from your heart for us, your sons and your daughters. In this one moment now, God, would you speak to us? May your voice be louder than anything else today. May we hear from you. Speak, Jesus. Come on, say that with me. Speak, Jesus. Come on, say it again. Speak, Jesus. We need to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said, amen and amen. You may take your seats. Amen. So good. Hey, help me thank the Lord for this time of worship today. Praise God. Holy forever and ever. Such a good time worshiping him. And I'm grateful we get the invitation to, uh, on a regular basis, come together in this space and lift our hearts to the Lord, lift our prayers, our praise, and uh, he invites us in. Amen. So thank you, worship team, for weekly uh, bringing us into his presence today. I'm grateful to continue in our series titled, Jesus Is. Uh, who he is changes everything about who we are. So the closer you get to King Jesus, I think the more joyful you'll be because he's the giver of joy. Uh, the more peace you'll have because he's the Prince of Peace. Right? The closer you'll get to God because Jesus, uh, he is the word became flesh. He is the manifestation of God. Walking the earth for us, dying for our sins, rising from the grave. Think about the past several weeks uh, for those who have joined us. And if this is your first time with us, we've been in this series called Jesus Is. And we've talked about how Jesus is the betrayed Messiah. We talked about how Jesus is the humble king who rides in on a donkey. We talked about how Jesus is the suffering servant who dies on the cross for all of our sins. He, he is the risen Savior who rose up from the grave. Last week, we talked about how he's the doubted God, how Jesus knows that there's one of his disciples, Thomas, who has questions, who's doubting. And I'm grateful that Thomas's doubt didn't paralyze him, but it in fact catalyzed him to even greater faith. And can I just say that today, if this is your first time here, or if you're back for another week and you're wrestling with some doubt, don't let that paralyze you. Don't let that stop you from growing in your faith in the Lord because Jesus is big enough, come on, and good enough to answer those questions. He's clear enough, and he wants to know you that much that you can bring it to him today. And last Sunday, we looked at the Gospel of John in chapter 20, and we began to survey this moment of, of the resurrected Christ and how Jesus doesn't just die and rise from the grave and the book closes, but there's a lot of stuff that happens after that. Amen? Uh, and, and we've been looking at some of the different principles from there. Today, I want us to lean into a different uh, angle, if you would, of a, a similar scene. It seems that what happened in John 20, where Jesus encounters the disciples and Thomas, the doubter, and changes his doubt to a shout, Right? He went from, I won't believe, to my Lord, my God. Such a significant moment. God can change anything, right? Doesn't matter what you brought into this place. The Lord says, bring it. And he can touch it. And he can change your life. Um, it seems that there's a different angle into that same night in that same room that the Gospel of Luke records that takes us a step further that I want us to look at here today. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Um, if you're ready, say ready. If you're hungry, say let's eat. So let's go ahead and jump into this evening. Now Jesus has been alive and resurrected for several days and he encounters the disciples in the upper room in verse 36. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're there by way of screens, say I'm there. Are we there? We're there. <laughs> Father, I pray right now as we open your word, 
holy and forever God, speak to us. We need to hear your voice. Help us to know you more through this message. Help us to understand your word better because of this message. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. I think that's an amen moment right there. Uh, I love that Jesus appears to the doubting, struggling, worried, nervous, anxious disciples. And he says, peace to you. Maybe he caught them off guard. Maybe they were a bit alarmed. Can I just say the Lord brings peace into your world today too? And receive it. Uh, Some of the greatest news to somebody who may be struggling is that God would come into your world and say, hey, peace. He says, peace to you, verse 37, but they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your heart, hearts? And I, I love that um, I felt led to go in this direction today because I typically know Thomas's testimony only from John's lens. So John's angle represents how Thomas was the one doubting. Jesus steps in and and speaks to him. What I love about this is that it shows hearts. In other words, there might have been some of the disciples who were troubled. Some of them also had doubts in their hearts. And so Jesus is speaking to the whole room here, right? Not even just singling out here. He says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. I love that right there. Jesus says, it's me, right? He says, it is I myself. It's interesting because in the, 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 the section right before this moment, Jesus appeared to two men walking down the road, Emmaus, And in that moment, he doesn't just jump in and say, it's me, the Christ. It's me, the Messiah. Even in there's a moment where um, some of the ladies who came and were encountered by Jesus, they thought he was a gardener. He kind of had an ordinary look, even in his resurrected state, right? And in this case, they're like, hold on a second. These doors were locked. It was just us. We're trying to figure everything out. Either we're hallucinating, we're in a dream, that's a spirit, or that's really him. And what does Jesus say? It's me. Or as Jesus, I I like to say, he, Jesus is him. Amen? I myself, uh, touch me, he says, and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones. You haven't seen a ghost. It's really the risen Lord. When he had said this, he showed them his hands. He showed them his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. So I think that the disciples, in a way, they had this disbelief about them that was also kind of like an excited, like it, it really might be him though. There was a bit of joy and, and marvel in their voice. He said to them, have you have anything to eat? Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a, uh, a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate Before them, verse 43, and I even love that moment right there. I think that's so of Luke. Um, If you look at the different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find in Luke's Gospels so much nuance and detail that in a lot of ways is different than the other Gospels. Just a little bit of historical context on Luke. So you have these four Gospels. This is kind of some some preaching and some teaching in one. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke's gospel is interesting because Luke wasn't, in fact, a follower of Jesus. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. So he was. He comes in later in the book of Acts. We know Luke as a physician, a scholar. He had really good penmanship in Greek, and and he he had a more scholarly way about his presence. And he wanted to develop the most orderly account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So what Luke did was he interviewed all the eyewitnesses, and he said, what happened on that moment? What happened in the boat? What happened at that night? And don't you love how they said, yeah, Jesus ate a fish, but it wasn't a fried fish. It wasn't a catfish. Come on, it was a broiled fish, amen? 
Do you want it blackened or grilled? What type of salmon, Jesus, right? The details of the Bible, the broiled fish, amen? Maybe that just nerds like me like that stuff, or maybe just like food people like me. Uh, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, right? Even Las Vegas. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, he says, hold on one second, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. So in this conclusion to the gospel of Luke, it's almost finished up. Luke wants us to know that Jesus appears to the disciples and he shows his very real sturdy evidence that he's not a ghost. He's not a spirit. He's not necessarily a uh, 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 the, the disciples aren't, aren't just dreaming this moment happened. He's wanting them to know. What does Jesus appeal to in this moment, right? He appeals to all the senses, doesn't he? He says, hey, check out my hands. You can see them. And he says, I want you to hear me speak. Peace to you. He speaks, and they can hear his voice. And then he says, um, touch me. In fact, for those who need to know that they can actually feel me, touch my hands, touch my body, right? But can you just uh, agree in this text that for whatever reason, even though they're seeing him, hearing him, touching him, th there's this essence that it's just not quite enough to convince these disciples that he is who he says he is. Until Jesus does something that the Gospel of John doesn't give us through that angle. It's actually in Luke's angle that I think is really neat. What happens next, church? Jesus says, okay, I just ate a fish. I just showed you my hands. I just showed you my scars. I just spoke to you and, and gave you peace. Now, everybody, let's do a Bible study. I love that. Jesus goes, you know what? Let me go ahead and bring the word to life for you right now. As I was thinking about what to title this sermon I went in a lot of different directions, but I really landed on this. Jesus is the word became flesh. Jesus is, right, we talked about a lot of who he is, but in this story, what I want us to realize is he's the word became flesh. And here's where I get that language from. If you just take a glance at John chapter 1, just stick with me for a moment here, and then we're going to get back into some application. Uh, John chapter 1, you'll find at the very beginning these words. Come on, let's read it together. Ready? Go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, that's big right there. Who's he? Who's he talking about? The authorship is speaking about Jesus. How do you know? Well, jump down to verse 14. It says, and the Word, capital W, became flesh and dwelt among us. The gospel writer John is trying to get us to see that the word of God, all 66 books of this amazing work of God, the word of God put skin on and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Listen to me today, church online, hear me. Uh, if you need a Jesus that's full of grace, he's there today. Come on, amen? If you blew it, if you've ruined it, if you've sinned, if you've fallen short, if you're in need of grace, Jesus is full of grace. If you're here today and you have doubts and you have questions and you're not sure and everybody's just kind of been a little bit iffy, can I just tell you he's full of truth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You can put your faith and confidence in him. Jesus is in the beginning as the word. But doesn't this remind you of a different scripture, anybody? 
This, to me, takes me to the very beginning days of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, Genesis 1, 1, right? Maybe you're familiar with this verse. If you open up your Bibles, you'll see, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit, capital S, of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said. I love the and God said because this is the first ever speaking moment in the history of the world. It comes from God. God invented speaking. God invented the word. And so you have the in the beginning, God created. And then John 1 says, in the beginning was God and he was God. And this word became flesh. And that word has a name and his name is Jesus, and now you fast forward to Luke 24, and Jesus is doing a Bible study with all the people, and he's saying, this is all about me. And I think it was a game-changing moment for the disciples, and that's where I arrive at this Jesus is moment. Jesus is the word became flesh. Now the question is, what, what should we do with that? How should we go about our lives because the word became flesh. I think there's three things that that teaches us about the 66 books of the Bible. And what I want to do in the rest of the time of this message is try to encourage you, not try to Bible thump anybody, okay? We probably have enough of that in our minds that is not helpful. But if I could just encourage you to consider a new level of relationship with the book, that would be my task today. Can I do it? Uh, are you open to that? My, my appeal to you today is that you would grow a deeper hunger for the Word of God and have the right motivation behind it. Point number one, what should we do with the Word became flesh? Number one, because He's the Word, we should read the Bible relationally. I want you to underline and circle the word relationally. Why do I say that? Well, because I think there's two ways to go about reading the Bible. Uh, one, you can read it informationally, where you're reading so that you can either get more knowledge in your head or you can check a box and you can say, I did it, I read the Bible. This is what I've found to be true for majority of people that try the Bible in a year plan. And in some of y'all, you know you did it on January 1st, but now it's four months in and that stopped a long time ago. Don't amen, all right? We, we ain't trying to out nobody, okay? And I've, I've never been able to finish a Bible in a year plan but I have been able to grow in my relationship with God. Here's why. Because if you do a Bible in a year plan and you miss two days, what ends up happening is now you read, have to read seven chapters, and what do you do? You just start reading for information. I just got to check this box. I got to get through it. I got to get through it. I got to get through it. When I believe Jesus, because he is the word and because Jesus came down from heaven to uh, save us and, and invite us to a relationship, we should read the Bible a lot less like a textbook and more like a love letter. A lot less like an info book that we just have to, all right, well, John chapter 1. Let me just go ahead and get this in so that they, in case anybody asks me, I can get this in. Can I just say, God wants to speak to you. Aren't you grateful that we have a God who speaks? I remember learning uh, in, a, in a philosophy lecture when I was a, a college student about this idea that nobody can fully understand who God is, and there's all types of religions, and it's closed-minded to actually believe one could be real, and there was this analogy that was given to the class that God is a lot like an elephant, and we're a lot like blind people trying to figure out what this animal is, and let's just say there's this religion here, and they're feeling, oh, the, the, God is a lot like, you know, they're feeling the tusk and the the, the legs, and somebody's over here on the tail, and they're just trying to describe this. And can I just tell you, that analogy breaks down the moment the elephant says, I'm an elephant, <laughs> and speaks. The reason why that analogy doesn't work is because we have a God who is revealing who he is. He is doing everything he can to say, I am who I am, yeah. right? You can, you can touch all you want. I'm telling you how he goes so far to send his own son to reveal very clearly who he is. 
And so today I would say the clearest, best, most authoritative way to know God is through the Bible. So don't read it like an info book, please. Read it like a relational book from the Lord himself. I love how Dr. James Merritt says it. He says it like this. The, the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. Amen. Come on, amen? amen? Maybe three of y'all were convinced by that. I, I, I can't stress it enough that God wants to know us. And he wants you to know him. I'll even just illustrate with a bit of my testimony. You know, I grew up here in Las Vegas and didn't have a church context. When I was in college, I got invited to a sports ministry called FCA, and I love the FCA ministry. I showed up for the free pizza. Let's go. It was a seed that grew. And I began to explore my faith in a real way, which led me to getting a Bible. And I'm grateful for the Bible that my mom mailed me. And I began to read it one chapter a day. I got some advice. They said, start in Matthew. So I said, okay, Matthew chapter 1, learning about Christmas. Matthew chapter 2, going a little bit deeper into Jesus now growing up. Matthew chapter 3, I'm meeting John the Baptist. And you find this baptism moment of Christ. John chapter 4, Jesus is in the wilderness. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is in the wilderness, right? And he's being tempted by Satan. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus begins to preach what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, there is a moment that changed my life. Can I bring you into it? Yeah. All right, I'm going to stay over on this side. Can I, can I bring y'all in? All right. Can I bring y'all into it too? Yeah. Now look, I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. What I'm about to share to me is the most terrifying verses in all of the Bible. And I think they, they could work on two, two sides. Either they can be the most terrifying or the most encouraging, depending on how you view it. Can I share it? Yeah. All right, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I just want you to look at this with me. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That to me made me slam on the brakes and say, Err! Because this isn't written to the atheist club, right? Not everyone who says to Jesus, oh, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, which should make us all say, well, what, what's the answer then? He says, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, which should then make us in turn say, well, then tell us the will of the Father. Because this is eternity on the line. I believe Jesus reveals the will of the Father in the next two verses. Here we go. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I can remember in my dorm room as a college student sitting there opening the Bible, realizing that the primary calling on my life was not to do something for Jesus. Because look, if I stacked up my one attendance to FCA to get the free pizza, these guys were doing miracles, exorcisms, casting out demons. These people were prophesying in the name of the Lord. And Jesus goes, I don't know you. If I stack my resume against them, they're not getting in either. And here's what I realized. They, 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 they took the wrong assignment. They missed it. They thought the primary calling was to do something for God when it was always to a relationship with God. They thought, hey, here's my resume. Lord, check me out. I did this, 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 and this. I even went to walk church. And I even went to VBS. And I got baptized at one point. Hey, listen, please do not put anything in the list of what you could do for God. Look at me, church. I hate to break it to you. God don't need you. You need him. I think that we think sometimes, oh, if I do this, I'll impress God. And I'll, I'll, I'll earn a tally. 
I'll earn a point. And God will say, okay, I'll, I'll show him some extra sprinkle of grace. If they do this, that's not the Bible, you guys. That's witchcraft, right? That right there is superstition. We have a God who speaks. What's he saying here in Matthew 7, right? Matthew 7, he's saying this. Primary calling is not that you do something for me. It's, I never knew you. This word, gnosko, friend, listen to me. Jesus wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. And so I'm less concerned with all the cool stuff you're doing. I'm more concerned, do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? And today, if you were to say, you know what? I really do want to get to know him. I really do want to have a relationship with him. I'm going to say to you today, get to know him. Jesus is the revealed word of God. So the more you get in this book, the more you're going to get to know his person, his personality, his presence, his words, his heart is going to be revealed through each page. Amen? Amen. And so I can't say to you enough because I don't want your testimony to be, I did a bunch of stuff for God while I was on earth, but I never knew him. How cold is that? That God is up there. We don't get to know him. We just get to work for him. That's not the God of the Bible. Amen. The Jesus that we believe in is a Jesus who desires for us to know him. So true. And that's good news. You couldn't read enough to earn it. Jesus is the word. You couldn't pray long enough to get tally points. Jesus prays for us. Come on. It's the reality of whether or not you know him changes everything. Amen? Amen. So I believe that it's better to read the Bible relationally than it is informationally. If you aim for relationship, you'll get information. (laughs) If you aim for information, you may never know him. And that's my prayer. You you know that the Pharisees in Jesus's day knew the Bible like the back of their hand. They would stand and they would meditate on the law of the Lord all day long. And Jesus is like, hey, hey, guys, y'all are, y'all, y'all are memorizing. I'm, guys, it's me. And they couldn't see him. And today, I don't want that to be you. Where you could go, go to church all your life and never know him. The goal is relationship. How, how weird would it be if you met somebody here today at Walk Church and you said, hey, good to meet you. Uh, I, I, let's, let's, let's connect sometime. And you say, okay, let's go to the Sunrise Cafe and get some blueberry pancakes. Come on. And some, let's get some broiled fish. Amen, right? L- let's eat together. And you show up and you meet the person and they pull out a little notebook and they go, okay, brown shirt, black jeans. About six foot tall. All right, cool. Uh, what's your name? All right. And you're like, what is this, an investigation? Are, wouldn't that be kind of weird? Maybe? Would you be like, what are we doing right now? I wonder if God sometimes is like, why are you just trying to get info on me? Don't you want to know me? I want to know you. I don't want just stats. I want your heart. Let me give you the second point. The second point of this message that I really think could be helpful if you're going to get to know him in a relational way is this. Take the whole book seriously. What do I mean when I say take the whole book seriously? Look at what Jesus says in, in Luke 24, verse 44. He says it like this. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Come on. Everybody say everything. everything. He says that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What, do you know how massive, gigantic of a statement this is? The resurrected Lord Jesus tells the disciples, let's have a quick Bible study. Go to the first five books. Let's go to the law of Moses. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Exodus. Let's go to Leviticus. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Numbers. And Jesus takes them on a journey and says, there I am. Check that. You know that moment right there? They go, yeah. He goes, that was me. 
Jesus goes, hey, you know that moment where Jacob, you guys know Jacob, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know that moment in, in Genesis 33 where Jacob had this wrestling match and he got his hip socket knocked out? Jesus goes, I was the wrestler. <laughs> Boom. Knocked it right out. They go, that was you? Jesus goes, you know, you know in Daniel, when the, the, the three guys on fire were in the fire, they got thrown in the fire? I was in there with them. And they go, hold on. You were? And Jesus goes, you know all the Psalms that David wrote? Those are all good stuff, right? Goes, they're, they're about me. I'm all up in there. They go, well, what about the prophets? What about Isaiah? And Jesus goes, go to Isaiah 53. That's about me. And they go, well, what about Malachi? And Jesus goes, that's about me. And they go, well, what about Jeremiah? All up in there. What about Habakkuk? Up in there. Well, what about Zephaniah? Jesus goes, I'm in there too. Right? Listen, the reason why you should have a healthy appetite for the Old and the New Testament is because it's all about him. Jesus takes them on a Bible study and he reveals himself and he gives them a new framework on how they should understand the scriptures. That's why we should take the whole book seriously. That's why we should be open to him speaking to us. And I just don't think today we take the whole book seriously enough. Hey, listen to me, church. I can't tell you that me, even as the senior pastor of this church, am, am, am always in the word like, I think I could even still grow. Come on. I'm in there, but you know, I feel like I could even get a little bit better. Does anybody else feel like that? Let me ask you a quick question. Can we just be transparent with the rest of our time? How many of you have a copy of God's Word? You have a Bible somewhere. You probably have one on your desk. You probably have one on your bookshelf. You probably have one maybe in your car. You probably have one on your phone. You probably have one in the office place, or maybe it's in your, on your nightstand. Let me just ask you this. How many times did you walk past it this week? I know too often for me, I walk past the book. It doesn't say anything. It just stares at me. And we go... Later, I promise you later, later. And, and we move on, right? And if we get a few moments, maybe what we'll do is we'll get a verse of the day and we'll try to get some info. But can I tell you, the Bible's much sweeter than that. And one of the reasons why I have chosen to start my day, I try to start every single day with the proverb of the day because before I hear a word from Instagram, before I hear a word from the TV, before I hear a word from my kids, come on, before I hear a word from anyone or anything else, I need to hear his voice first. And there's a chapter of wisdom for every day of the, every day. This morning, I thought, before I go into church, I want to hear from Proverbs 14. And I just began to peruse through the 35 verses of Proverbs 14. It was a whole master class on wisdom. And I, I, I jotted down Proverbs 14, verse 12, because it, it, it intrigued me. Let's read it together. Ready, set, go. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And I thought, I wonder how many people, including myself, oftentimes think, man, this is right. This is the way. This is it. And it's leading to a dead end. It's leading to a dead end. It's leading to death. If you only live life based off your feelings and emotion, you won't live life. You'll run into the dead end. The wisdom of God teaches us there's a lot of things that seem right to us. And sometimes we'll even surround ourselves with yes men who will just tell you whatever you want to hear. But listen, if you open this up, you'll get it right. I wrote it down like this, kind of my own reality statement. If there's a way that seems right to man, well, there's a way that seems right to the Lord. And it's revealed in the Bible. So I'm not trying to force you and, and compel you through hell and brimstone that you need to read your Bible more. Because more Bible reading doesn't get you into heaven. Jesus does. But more Bible reading, relationally, ooh, will get you to know Jesus better which is the primary calling on all of our lives. And I believe that's only going to happen if you take it more serious. 
Like, don't ju- like a lot of people go, oh, yeah, I, I read the Bible. My favorite verse is John 3, 16. I can quote it for you. I'll say, do you have any other verses? Because there's a lot of other good ones. Not, no slight to that one, but there's all types. There's an ocean. Swim in it. I love how Charles Spurgeon says it as he writes exhaustively on the power of the scriptures. Spurgeon says, nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. Amen? It just gets bigger. It just gets wider. Oh, please don't be the person who goes, oh, I, I graduated from the, I read the Bible when I was in college. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, re- I used to read the Bible. I read it. I've, I've read it. No, friend. If that's your mentality, you haven't read it enough. Because the Bible just gets bigger and gets wider. And every season of life gives us a new perspective on what we're reading. Amen? That's the reason why the author of Hebrews says the Bible is living and active. So regardless of what age or stage you're in, it's going to be alive and active for what you need in that moment. Come on, amen? So I want to compel you today with encouragement, not with force. Get back in the book. In the last two services, I've had different people pull me aside. One person in the first service said, Pastor Hyden, we started the year off so strong in the word. And just kind of like, anybody ever been to the ocean? Come on, you ever just, you, you, you go on the sand and you get, your, you get your towel out, you park your umbrella, you go out in the water, and what happens? You look back in five minutes and your umbrella was right here and now you're somehow over here, right? But you didn't mean to do that. And what do you got to do? You got to get back in a line with the home base. The Bible is the way to do that. And so I actually am not even tripping on whatever book you pick. Pick a book. If it's Genesis and you want to start from the beginning, you're going to get to know the creation account, and you're going to get to know Adam and Eve, and you're going to get to know all the different people, Abraham and his co- If it's in the Gospels, pick, pick one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you want some more details, pick Luke. If you want the Sports Center top 10 of Jesus, pick Mark. If you want the more Jewish version of Jesus and you want to see him hit all the holidays in, 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 in a more lengthy version, pick Matthew. If you want Jesus, the God man, right, the I am, you'll find Jesus in John. If you want some more letters, like Pauline letters to the Philippians or the Galatians or the Corinthians or the Romans or the Thessalonians, if you want to learn about the end times, pick the Revelations. If you want to look at, learn about the Psalms, pick the Psalms, right? If you want to learn about David, go into first and second, go somewhere. Come on, amen. Go somewhere. Open the book. If you open the book, it'll open you. And see what God wants to speak to you. Don't just read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. That leads me to my last and final point. And I'm going to make it quick. Final point. When it comes to the word made flesh, we should read the Bible relationally. We should take the whole book seriously. And we should pray for a greater understanding. I don't think you're wrong at all before you open up your Bible or before you scroll to the app for you to just shoot up a prayer to the Lord and say, God, help me to understand what I'm about to read. God, help me to, one, know you better as I read and help me to understand what I read. Look at what Jesus says, right, in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 or 45. Uh, he, He opens to them and tells them everything written about him in the law, the prophets, the Psalms. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Come on. That's what I need right there. Lord, I don't want, I don't, God, I don't have time to waste. I don't have time to just drive by your word. Lord, I need to understand this thing. Holy Spirit, jump into this five minutes of Bible reading and give me the maximum impact of it. Help me to understand what I'm reading. Help me to know you better because of it. Amen. In fact, this is a prayer to pray. I'll put it up here on the screen. Just a, a simple prayer that you can consider as you read. You can take a picture of, of it if you want. We're also going to post it on social media. It's just something that you can pray before you read. Father, I want to know you more. Remember, that's the goal, right? The goal of Bible reading is not to know the Bible. It's to know God. Father, I want to know you more. As I read your word, please speak clearly to me. Help me understand it, and Holy Spirit, make it fresh. You know what that is? 
That's just asking God to do it. And can I tell you, God wants to. And he will. I want to invite you this week to just get a new relationship with the word of God. I don't know if you have a Bible. If you need a Bible, we have these hardback ESVs. I'm not sure how many more we have left because each service we've invited people to just grab one for free. Uh, We want to just distribute the word as much as we can. We have a a rack of Bibles right back there. You don't even have to ask anybody. Just go up and just, if you really want one of these and you're going to try to apply it, grab it as a gift from us to you. And keep the word close, amen? Charles Spurgeon says, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't, right? Be in the word. Let the word be ever be on... I'll tell you what, most days when I spend time with God, God uses that time to give to somebody else. I'll start texting people. I'll start sharing it online. I'll I'll, I'll come into our staff meeting. This is what the Lord spoke to me today. I got a word, amen? I think we could all have a... if, if uh, If everybody in this room and online gets a word from the word and we share that word, come on, amen? Our city's gonna look different. Or how, just share it with your kids. <laughs> share it with yourself in the mirror. Share it with your heart. I believe the Lord will make it clear. God, give us understanding. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. I thank you that you didn't stop just at showing your hands. You didn't stop just at showing your feet. You didn't stop at just uh, eating the fish. You didn't stop just at doing all these things, but instead, God, you began to reveal through the written, inspired word who you are. And then you opened their minds to understand. I want to invite you to pray with me right now. You can do it silently in your heart, but let's all pray together. If you're open to that, just say, Lord, help me to understand your word, your gospel, your power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a new motivation. Give me a new crave for your word. Make it fresh. Make it clear. And today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you've yet to put your faith all in on Him. I want to invite you to do that now by faith. Let's just pray this prayer together. Just say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to get saved. You've led me to this moment. And now I declare that you're my God, my Lord and my God. I turn away from my sins. And by faith, I turn to you. Forgive me of all my wrongdoings. Thank you for your blood that washes away my sins. I believe you died for it. I believe you rose from the grave. And today, I'm all in. I'm yours. Thank you for adopting me into your family and making me new by faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for that? Somebody took a step today. I believe somebody was ushered into the, somebody's name was written into the Lamb's Book of Life because they came to Walk Church on April the 14th, 2024 and said yes to Jesus. And we're excited about that. I want us to respond now. We're going to sing this song of worship and the altar's open. You can come down and pray with any of our leaders, but let's now respond to the word of God. Cause your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, see your praise will ever be 
silencing fear in this place today. Thank you for making the darkness tremble. You light it up, God. If anybody else is just in this moment of prayer and worship, don't feel rushed. Continue to worship through it. Uh, Take your time. And God, I pray that uh, your word would be on our lips. Your praise would be on our lips. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, you can go ahead and grab a seat. We're getting ready to close out our service. But I'm deeply grateful that you chose to get here today. Uh, It's an honor, and I'm grateful for how God is moving in the life of our church, in our community, in our city. And today, if you did make a decision to receive the Lord Jesus, please fill out this connection card and take your next step. Whatever that may be, if it's, as Pastor Marvin, you shared so greatly earlier, um, if it's baptism, we just had two powerful testimonies of uh, faith. My, my brother who got baptized, Davis, he said, um, he said, well, I'm going into this water, uh, the old me, the prideful me, and it's staying there. And I'm coming out redeemed. I'm coming out fresh. I'm coming out declaring what Jesus has done in my life. And I think that's just powerful for him to declare what God has done in his life. And so whatever your story is or your next step is, We'd love to hear about it on this card. Today, if you received Jesus for the first time ever, please let us know so we can celebrate that, we can follow up with you, we can help you take your next step in your walk with the Lord. Today, if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray with you and for you. As Pastor Marvin said, we had the most prayer cards ever get submitted last Sunday. Come on, let's keep going. Let's keep flooding heaven. God's big enough to hear them all, right? Let's take these to him. And let's ask God to work in areas that we can. Pray for people. Pray for illness. Pray for yourself. Pray for family. Pray for struggle. And praise God for things happening as well. So if you have a praise report, let us know on this as well so we can celebrate it with you on Tuesday and Wednesday night also. Lastly, if you're making a gift of generosity, uh, you can use this generosity envelope. It's the spirit by which we give. It's a generous spirit. When you give to Walk Church, you help the mission of Walk Church come alive to free people to walk in Jesus in Las Vegas and beyond. And we as a church, we love partnering with other ministries, especially here locally, to reach students and athletes and all types of people from all types of spaces. And one of the ministries we support is called FCA, Fellowship Christian Athletes. And FCA, you heard me reference it in my testimony. It's a special ministry that we get a part to get to play a part in working with. And even some of our team here at Walk Church serve on the Las Vegas FCA staff. I see my brother George over here as part of the FCA staff. Um, Coach Jermone over here, part of the FCA staff. Teddy and Kehlani as well. And my sister Kinsey, who's right here on the stage. Let's give it up for Kinsey. Um, Kinsey on our worship team uh, and also serves on our local FCA Vegas staff. And so we decided as a church that we're gonna support and sponsor the upcoming golf tournament that FCA is putting on. So you can count on a golf team from Walk Church, all right? And um, I just thought it'd be cool to uh, hear a little bit. I do know the golf tournament is tomorrow, which is pretty rapid, Um, but um, somebody may be inspired and wanna be a part of it. So why don't you share with them? Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Hayden. And I said this in the last service, but I've been in FCA since I was 14 years old, and I've been on staff for seven years. And being a part of Walk Church and on staff with FCA, I've never felt more supported by Pastor wow. Hayden and um, First Lady Nina and the Walk Church staff. I'm wow. so grateful um, for all the support they've shown us, but in the city. So Amen. thank you You're for um, being a part of the golf tournament. Hey, but, we get to do that, right, yes. church? Amen. 
We believe in it. To and through the church, um, you guys are so a huge part of that. But I want to invite you to come to the golf tournament. If you golf and you want to aid in the mission of student athletes and coaches growing in the relationship with Christ and his church, be a part of it. Come through, play golf. It's at Canyon Gate Country Club, Country Club in Summerlin, and it starts at 9 a.m. So we would love to have you. Um, with FCA, we're raising money for the students to go to FCA camp. So this summer, um, it's $650 for each student to go to camp. So even if you just want to give to that, maybe you don't golf and you're interested in just donating, we'd love to talk to you more about it. So George and myself are available. Coach Dramon is here as well. So if you have any questions, let us know, or any of the walk staff. Yeah, so Thank cool. You. And I also heard, George, that some of our um, Silverado and Liberty FCA students made it to Ignite Night this past week. Um, so I think that's really cool how we're reaching students right where they're at on the campus. Um, and pizza goes a long way. Come on. And um, I'm grateful that, that we can connect that to the local church, the body of Christ, um, which is where Jesus really it, it is, right? He's with his body. And so I'm, I love that and I'm grateful for the golf tournament. Hey, if you want to uh, be a part of that, you can even just put on a connection card, FCA Golf, and we'll follow up with you and get you the information uh, that you need. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to pray for us and then we'll be out. Uh, God, thank you for this time today. Thank you for FCA. Thank you for all the gifts being given and the generosity of this church. God, I pray you'd bless the golf tournament and that you would bless us now as we exit. Um, God, I pray you'd speak to us through your word in powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday, Walk Family. You are sent. All right.